Okay, so today I am introducing Anne Welch. She's an entrepreneur who is a licensed curriculum professional. And what she does that's unique is that she really honors students' strengths and interests while meeting the standards being required. She's been helping adolescents, young adults, and young children uh, experience more success, however you might define success. And this involves you know, mindset, goal setting, evaluation, um, identifying barriers to achievement, and, and identifying the support supports needed to get past those barriers. Um, so she's been doing uh, this sort of design stuff on her own for the last four years. Before that, she worked at a school for boys with big challenges. And before that, she worked in grade school and middle school. And she's also had some homeschooling experience uh, and curriculum design there as well. So it's, it's quite a mixed bag in terms of education, but I'm sure you can see as I do, how this would really help those of us dealing with autism. So for those of you who are new to me, I'm Jackie McMillan. I am an entrepreneur. I run Thrive With Autism and I have autism. Um, when I'm not in environments that support me well, I stop being able to function well. And uh, so I'm, I'm really glad you're joining us today and looking forward to letting you hear a little bit more about how Anne does what she does to support students in learning optimally. So Anne, welcome. Thank you. I'm very honored to be here. I was looking at your website before we talked and I really think that the work that you're doing is just so important and the way that you are explaining why things work the way that they do and, and how these things can be helpful and here are the reasons why and that's huge. So many people just say, okay, do this, do that and you know, but they don't explain why. And if you don't know why, you can't tweak it and individualize it to meet your specific needs or the specific needs of people that you're trying to help. Yeah, 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 it's, it's a challenge. So, so what kind of took you down this, this rabbit hole of supporting kids with special challenges? Uh, I really feel like I, I was guided to be there. I was in the position where I was looking for a job and I found out about this school. Never in a million years did I think that I was going to be working with, um, with teenagers and then let alone teenagers with uh, specific issues and difficulties uh, there specifically conduct and emotional disorders. They're the kids that are not making it in the schools and the schools are saying, okay, we need someplace else for these kids to be because we just don't have the resources to meet their needs. Right. From there, as I was working with these boys and working on social emotional skills and working on goal setting and things that they need in order to be able to thrive, in everyday life, it occurred to me that all of these things that I was teaching these students who were being labeled as different, these are things that are important for everyone to know how to do. It's not something that's, that's specific to one group of people. I really believe everybody on the planet needs to understand how to develop a growth mindset and how to be able to look at what's going on with themselves, that self-awareness piece in order to plan their next steps meaningfully. So you have no idea how exciting it is to me to hear you say that because when I, when I talk to educators or when I give um, uh, you know, professional development trainings, a lot of educators are in a place of, you know, well, what's going to happen to the rest of the students if I'm shaping my classroom to support people with learning disabilities like autism? And I'm like, okay, how we teach doesn't suit everybody. If you suit your programming and how you set it up to the people who've got the biggest challenges in the classroom, everybody learns better. Because what you're doing is you're adapting your teaching to how people learn. And that's not rocket science and it's not really difficult. It's just a really different way of looking at teaching and looking at a classroom setting. So tell me more about how you adapt things. 
Well, it really involves getting to know the students that I'm working with. Um, when I was in the school setting, one of the ways that I adapted things, I, I found that, well, as a school, we were admitting that there were a whole group of students who kept leaving the school and going outside and they weren't able to, to spend the time in the classroom. And if they're not in the classroom, it's hard to deliver instruction because you do have students who are in the classroom. So we created a special classroom space that serves a wide variety of students. It wasn't just, we, you know, we, we created the space with these students in mind, but we built it um, in a way that any students who were struggling could thrive there. The classroom had um, cubbies, like, uh, so you had a desk and you had walls, um, bookcases that partitioned the desks so that each student had their own private place where they could work if they needed to have some of those distractions out of their way. But they weren't outside of the class. So we did have some students who were autistic we had a rocker who's very near and dear to my heart. And he would go to his seat area and stand there and he would rock. The students who are participating at the table in the class are not seeing him rock. And it's not about keeping them from being able to see him. It's about his rocking, which he needs to do not being a distraction for them, but he's still in the classroom. He's still a part of everything that's going on. In fact, there's not a whole lot of space between the table and the desks that, you know, line the room. So this happened to be a strategy that really brought more students into that classroom. We also decided that the teachers should go to the classroom rather than the students switching classrooms and going here and there every period. And, you know, um, for many students, that can be overwhelming. Oh my gosh. I used to carry from, from grade seven when it started, from grade seven right till I finished university, in the front of every textbook or the back, if it would hide better there, I would have a schedule of where I was going next and where it was in the school because I couldn't remember that without being able to kind of go, okay, where am I going next? Okay, right. And, and then get there because I could do one step at a time and I could, you know, when I had environments that weren't distracting, I could say, okay, tomorrow I need to do this. Oh, and I need to do that. And I could put that information together in a non-distracting environment, but to do that in the school, there's no way, there's no way I could do it. So good for you. Just one classroom. And you talk a lot about stress and the impact of, of that. You talk specifically on people with autism, but stress affects all of us greatly. That stress of having to navigate where you're supposed to be when, it's, it's just not necessary for, um, for students who are struggling to begin with. You know, that's, yeah. it's, yeah. So that's a way to meet student needs in a, in a school setting. When I'm so, working, oh, go ahead. Oh, so uh, it sounded like you had another idea there. I'm gonna per pursue this thought later. Go, you go ahead. Oh, okay. I was just gonna talk about working one-on-one -on -one with students where um, that's where I really take the time to get to know the students and what, who they are, what their interests are, what their strengths are, and help them do some investigation into themselves about what things work best for them, what things help, what things um, make, make things difficult, and then help kind of pull that all together to make a plan for them. I teach time management as one of the skills, and there are a lot of different ways to manage time, all different strategies. They've all got names. I mean, you Google search it and it can be overwhelming. So I will teach several and then the students will use what's best for them. But 
I had a student um, just in the spring semester say, I love the Pomodoro method, which is you're, count, you're taking 20 minutes so that you're focusing on something and then shifting to something else. She said, I really like that, but it's not working for me. It's too long. I can't focus for 20 minutes. So I said, how long can you focus for? She said, I can get 10 good minutes. After 10, I start to lose focus. So I said, do the Pomodoro method with 10, uh, not 10 seconds, sorry, 10 minutes, you know, with 10 minute intervals instead of 20, you know? And she was like, I can do that. <laughs> yes, because that's what you need. That's how you work, you know? Yeah. Oh, that's, that's, that's really marvelous. I mean, one of the challenges that those of us with autism find is that um, there's that monotropism where we focus in on one thing to shut everything else out in order to be able to really understand it and work with it. But we completely lose track of time. We lose track of food. We lose track of sleep. We lose track of bathrooms, you know, and we're just like <laughs> arrowing in on this one thing that holds our focus and interest. Um, it's really, really disruptive for us to have things that interrupt that focus because the process of reintroducing ourselves to a subject is so time intensive for us. So, you know, you wouldn't do Pomodoros necessarily with someone who has autism. What right. kinds of things would you do? Um, just from what you describe, and I'm going to be very clear, you are an expert on autism. I've had experience working with students with autism, but I, I do not have all the answers. Um, however, from what you just described, I think that I would be looking for um, some rituals or routines that can help you ease out of that focus. So you don't want something to interrupt you. You might have a soft sound that cues you that in about 10, five or 10 minutes, you might want to you know, stop or shift gears, but then you might want to do something. And again, you keep going back to stress and I love that because, sorry, you go back to that in your website um, because it's just so important for everybody to be thinking about. But then you might build in an activity that's really um, stress reducing. You talked about music as being an example, you know, maybe you go listen to some music and then shift gears to the next activity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is that so, something that sounds like it might work for people with autism? Yeah. And I think that, I think that what, what might make sense is to sort of decide what your chunk time is going to be, whether it's two mm -hmm. hours or three hours or whatever, that you're going to let yourself do that deep focus. And then, and then set some kind of timer that's going to have music you love that comes on at the end of that. Because yeah. that, that kind of thing gives you a gentle transition out of, oh, I really like this. Okay, yes, it's time for a bathroom break. Oh, I'm hungry. Oh, I, my body needs to move. You, you know, just starting yeah. to register those other things that you lose track of when you go into monotropism. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so the question I was, oops. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to say about that, though, is that there have been a lot of studies around mindfulness activities and practices that have been specifically linked to autism, helping to, um, uh, to ease you out of those specific, uh, um, what you called it, mono... Monotropism. Monotropism, so, so to ease you out of the monotropism, becoming more aware of your surroundings, doing body scan to see, oh, am I tired, am I hungry, those types of things. Yeah, mindfulness is helpful. The challenge is that the monotropism is a coping mechanism that we've developed to deal with uh, how to get things done in the context of a very noisy body and very distracting you know, surroundings in one way or another. And so it's a deliberate shutting out of everything else in order to be able to accomplish or problem solve. And um, 
the mindfulness is one of those things that can really help with starting to notice what's helping, what's hurting, what makes me able to do more, all of those things. But it's, it's not necessarily a good disruption for the focal ability, which is itself a coping mechanism, a support for our situation. So, um, yeah, yeah, I, I, uh, I, like, I like where you're thinking about this, though. Um, I have a question. You, one of the things you said right at the beginning was that uh, when you worked in that, in that uh, school for teenagers, who were really having a lot of trouble behaviorally and, and emotionally, that a lot of them were going outside. Did you ever do out, outdoor programming with them? The campus actually happens to be on this, I think there's 42 acres wow. of amazing, um, amazing land. So yes, um, it, the teenagers in general just love that outdoor time. And so we would do, um, you know, if we were reading a novel, we would be reading outside if the weather was good. We had a lot of different activities that we built into our day where we would pull students out of the classes to go skiing or to do some snowshoeing around the campus or to um, go sledding, you know, if, um, if things had been particularly stressful, like maybe it was a week where there were a lot of tests, then we might schedule a sledding party at the end of the tests, or if it's nicer weather, hiking, there's a pond, so we take the kids fishing and, and all of that. There's a lot of flexibility to meet students' needs in that way. And then in the same way, there's also the ability for students to say, I need a break. And they go outside, they take the time that they need, and then they come back in. So they can do that. We were just finding that they were spending way more time outside than they were in the classroom. So we had to make the classroom more appealing to them. And I think in many ways, feel safer or less stressful to them. More supportive, more accommodating. Uh, recognizing where their needs were not being met and meeting more of those needs. Yeah, yeah it's so important. So um, with the work that you're stepping into now as a consultant, is it going to be mostly online? Are you going to be going to schools? Are you going to be working with homeschoolers? How, how are you planning to do this? That's a great question. The, the answers to those questions have really been unfolding over the past four or five months. I am working with schools providing professional development for teachers to teach them how to incorporate mindfulness practices, growth mindset, goal setting, things of that nature into their classrooms. I also um, am working with individuals. I'm working with a, um, with a school <laughs> that has been established to help homeschool families as well. And so I'm really working with all young adults and teenagers who are struggling or um, want some extra support, especially with the virus and, and everything. I can do that in person. Um, but I'm not going to limit it to being in person. I want to have the virtual opportunities available for people who live a distance away, but also for people who are not comfortable, especially with the virus, um, it, having that in-person uh, piece. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, one of the things that many autism parents are really struggling with with this time of COVID and, and social isolation is that their children uh, are, are, many of their children are learning independently, but when there are, there are classroom or anything other than one-to-one -one in an electronic format, the kids are getting, getting distracted or are not understanding what's going on. How do you think you're going to handle? Are you going to be doing mainly one-on-one -on -one or are you going to be trying to, to teach people to do group work or doing group work yourself? I'm going to say it's going to be a little bit of each. So there are going to be students who are not going to thrive in a group situation, especially virtually. 
there are students who are going to thrive having that peer interaction and, and the group um, support through the journey. And so I might even try to um, incorporate, if I'm working with somebody individually, have a web page that I'm monitoring where all the students can chat and share information. Uh, so there's a lot of different possibilities. Again, it really depends on what the individual student needs and what would be best for them. Right, right. So are there any tips that you have for educators or parents who have kids with learning challenges, behavioral challenges, and somewhere in the autism spectrum, dyslexia, Tourette's, ADHD, um, Asperger's, uh, <laughs> nonverbal, whatever it looks like. Like how, 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 would you, how would you encourage or support or engage parents and educators dealing with special challenges? Um, first of all, I would say to parents and educators and, and everyone who is working with those children that you don't have to know it all. There are resources out there. Don't, don't feel like you have to solve every problem. You have to be the, the be all and end all. To educators, I would say absolutely talk to the parents a lot because they know the student far better than you could ever in, in, you know, teachers do end up spending a great deal of time with the students, but especially initially, um, really get to know the student through the parent's eyes, as well as through your own educator eyes, as well as through the student's eyes to the best of their ability to describe what works for them. When I just did the, the training for teachers, and this was just yesterday, I said, you should be talking with all of your students who, by the way, are coming in in person. I said, and you should do a positive, um, it's called a plus delta chart, where the plus side is everything that went well with virtual learning in the spring and everything students wish could change so that they have all that information for what worked and what didn't through the student size. They know as educators what worked and what did, didn't. So the more that you can involve students in the engagement and in the ownership of their education, that, that feeling that they can do things. If you have students on an IEP, I believe that the students really, especially as they get older, um, they really need to be a part of developing that IEP. They should know their IEP inside and out, and they should be informing the professionals about what to put into their IEP. And that stepping usually, into their own advocacy. Yes, yeah. that usually happens with transition pieces but it's really important for the whole document. Mm -hmm. And it's really important for the life after school to have had that training in stepping into advocacy for yourself, because the reality is in whatever hobby, workplace, volunteer situations you end up in after school, you're going to have to advocate for yourself to create the environments that you can really be contributing in. Yeah. And that's important for everybody to learn, disability or not, how to advocate for what you need and, and to make those things happen, to set yourself up for the most success. Wow. And is there any, are there any sort of last points you want to make sure you make? Um, it's just that, I, you know, I'm really passionate about this work. And when I talk to teachers and parents and and students about it and, and really share with them why the work is so important and what's happening in the brain that makes it important, what it can do in individuals' lives, then I really feel that that, is, that passion starts to be contagious and they wanna go out and they wanna do it too. So I also work with parents and families 
so that they can support their students in these changes and, and the growth that they're in the, in the process of. That's great. So Anne, I, I just want to say thank you. I know it was kind of a spur of the moment, oh, I want to speak with you. <laughs> and, and, and it was like, yes, I'm really glad we spoke. <laughs> so thank you so much for making time for this. Um, and I will, I will look forward to next, whatever that looks like. Great, and thank you so much. And I do want to say I want to keep in touch and be aware of what's going on with your business because I may have students that come to me that would really benefit from that. And I want to make sure that they get the, the best that they can get, you know? Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, I will look forward to next. <laughs> you take good care. You too. Bye-bye.